Hey everyone, in this lecture I want to introduce the concept of a train and a test split, and also talk about cross-validation, which is a mechanism to simulate the train-test split process on just our training data as we go through the process of model design. So previously we worked through the process of uh, constructing a sequence of increasingly richer feature functions until we essentially overfit the data. So I want to recap what happened. Um, so we, we had this data set that consisted of just these blue points here. Um, and so using just that small sample of data, we started with a linear model, and then we introduced these radial basis functions. Um, and then we, uh, with the green line, we, or sorry, with the, uh, the cyan colored line, we, actually no, sorry, the orange colored line, we introduced radial basis functions combined with the, the linear models. So we had uh, a fairly large number of features. And then with the cyan colored line, we ended up going to a number of features that was as, uh, equal to the size of the data set. Um, and we were able to get the model to pass through all of the, the data points. We were able to effectively set the loss all the way to zero. Um, and when we told you the recipe for, for developing models, for fitting models, or for training models, um, we, we set the goal of minimizing the loss. And, and that is the goal that we typically have when we, we approach these problems. But the reality is that that's actually not the goal we have when we think about the, the broader context of the problem. And that is that ultimately we don't want to uh, fit the data. We want to be able to make predictions about the future. The data is our best uh, surrogate for the future. So fitting the data is, is a rational way to think about modeling for the future. Uh, the problem with that, though, is that we can, in this case, overfit to the data. And this is the concept of overfitting. So our, our models is geared to all the, the nuances or noise in that data, is, is optimized to, to fit all that noise. Uh, and so when we get any new data, so that's illustrated by these red uh, crosses, uh, when we get new data, the error in those models can be substantial. So this, this cyan curve goes way up top um, and then uh, not even close to these uh, the, 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 the red crosses. So uh, this manifests itself when we look at the difference between the training and test loss. So here we've plotted on, on this side of the, the, the slide here. Um, the blue uh, bars correspond to the training loss for each of the different models, and the red bars correspond to the test loss. Now there are a few trends that I want to point out that are pretty important and very common. Uh, that is one, that the training loss typically underestimates the test loss. So when we're done training and we say, well, our error on a training set is some, you know, is some number, um, we expect that when we encounter new data or new problems in the world, that our error is going to be slightly higher. And that's in part because we've already started to optimize for the data we have and not necessarily the, the data we will see in the future. Uh, the next thing to notice is that uh, as we made the model, we went from a linear model to the RBF model. In this case, the trending loss actually went up. So even though the mo the, this uh, purple curve um, is a little more complex than the linear model, it wasn't able to actually capture what is effectively just a simple linear trend. Uh, so the training loss went up, but then as we started to introduce more of these bumps, so the orange curve, for example, uh, we're able to get closer to our, our training data. Uh, and in fact, with the, again, the, the cyan curve, we're able to get very close, if not passing directly through the training data. So as we did that, the training loss started to go down. Um, but at the same time, the test loss started to go up through this process. So we kept on making the model worse. Now, unfortunately, in this case, the line was the best curve or the best model, but it's possible in some scenarios that there's some curve maybe in between the line and the, the, uh, the RBF4 model. So maybe there's a model in here that might have actually had a lower test loss as well. Uh, and we'll present some examples of this in, in the upcoming notebook. All right, so, so that's, that's where we are. Uh, and at the end of the last lecture, we talked a bit about this, this kind of famous plot uh, and so this is something you should try to remember or take away from this class, which is how we think about uh, model complexity, so our ability to capture uh, weird, complex phenomena in our data. So you can think of the simplest model as just a constant, just predict always the same value, the average, or something you've seen from the past. And then as we start to incorporate more functions or more complex relationships with our features, that increases our model complexity. So that's this axis. And then the y-axis, this is the error in our model. So uh, lower would be better. And, and this uh, corresponds to the loss when we think about the like least squares. Um, so error and loss are often used interchangeably. Uh, and then this is a cartoon, but a lot of problems will have this structure. That as we increase the model complexity, our training error is going to continue to go down. So we're going to improve our ability to fit the data by uh, admitting more complex functions. Um, but at some point, our test error will go down and then go back up. And so our goal is to find this point here in the middle where our test error is the lowest. 
right? And anything to the left of that, we're sort of underfitting. There's more opportunity to exploit structure in the data that we're not yet capturing in our model. And to the right of this, uh, our test error is going up. And at this point, it is that our model has gotten so complex um, that it's starting to fit the noise and trying to generalize the noise uh, to new problems. And again, as I, I noted earlier, it is typically the case that the training error is going to underestimate the test error. So what you see at the end of training is kind of a lower estimate of the test error you would expect to see. So I keep talking about training and test. Uh, this is terminology that, that uh, is common in machine learning, where learning is you know, training. Uh, but it, it is now pretty broadly accepted as a way of, of dividing the two kinds of error you might see that on the data you have, and then the error you'd sort of expect to see as you generalize to new unseen data. Uh, when we're actually building a model, we have a challenge of we really have just a training data set. And we'd like to understand what this orange curve looks like, but we don't have the future. And so a very simple solution to this is what's called the train-test split. And this is a really important and a big idea in machine learning. So the train-test split uh, essentially takes our training data, uh, and instead of thinking of it as just training data, you split it. Um, you split it at some point. Uh, we'll talk about how in a moment. Uh, and some fraction of the training data becomes the test data set. Uh, and the remaining fraction of the training data stays the training data set. Now, what we're going to do then is we're not going to look at this test data. So this is going to be a mechanism that we can then use once we've chosen and fit our model using, let's say, least squares uh, regression uh, or some more sophisticated modeling technique. Once we fit the model on just the training data, we can then use the test data to evaluate the quality of that model. And so if we had overfit to the training data, um, assuming this was chosen at random from our, our training data set, then this would be data noise uh, or data or patterns that we didn't necessarily see in our training data, uh, and we would actually see some uh, increased error on this test data. So that's the big idea. So maybe the first challenge is how should I split my data? Um, you could imagine splitting it randomly, temporally. You might, if it were geographic data, you might split it by region. Um, and really, this is going to depend on the application. We could split the data randomly. That's a pretty common strategy. Uh, so we would shuffle the data and choose a random fraction. Now, the next question is, what fraction? So how much should we use? Uh, a pretty standard technique for this might be something like 90% of our data will be kept as training data, and 10% will be kept as test data. Now, there's sort of a trade-off that we have to consider here. Um, so if we make the training set larger, uh, if we keep more data for training, then we can typically support more complex models and be able to distinguish between noise in our data and the underlying uh, phenomena that we're trying to model. Uh, now, unfortunately, as we make the test set really small, we're going to get pretty crude estimates of our test accuracy. And if you imagine uh, we just have one data point, you know, any variability in that one data point could make a really good model look really bad. Um, so we, we also have this trade-off. We'd like to keep the test set large enough that we can get a good estimate of the, the test quality of our model. So what are ratios people typically use? Uh, somewhere between around 75% training to 90% training, and then therefore 25 to 10% test. Um, this can vary across uh, applications. Some people might even go down to 50-50. Uh, this is uh, sort of up to the choice of the modeler. Now, there's one important rule, and you must remember this rule. Once you have split your data into training and test, you should not look at the test data until you're finished training. If you use the test data during training, then it is no longer test data, it is training data. So it is very important that once you split off the test data, you do not make any modeling decisions uh, that are informed by the performance on that test data set. The only decision you might make is whether or not to ship a model or to start over. And as soon as you make that kind of decision, uh, you've essentially contaminated your test data and you probably need to think about collecting more test data. Okay, so don't use the test data. All right, so we were able to split our, our data into training and test data sets. And now we have a test data set that we can't look at. But we want to make decisions in our modeling process um, whether or not to add an additional feature or whether or not we might want to add a whole slew of, of new features or remove some features um, to try to improve our, the accuracy of our model. 
Again, if we keep just looking at the training loss, we're going to, to essentially start to overfit to the training data. So we'd really like to look at that test data set, um, but we're not supposed to. Right? So what might you do if you can't look at this test data set, but you really want to, and all you're left with is the training data? Well, uh, you might do the same thing again. So if we take our training data set, uh, we can again split that once more into a training, a sub-sub-training data set, and a validation data set that will validate our training. We're not going to test our model on this. We're just validating the model. So it's distinct from the, the training data or from the test data set. Um, and its sole role of this little data set is to validate. Now, the problem is uh, we're going to need to do this often uh, as we try different feature functions. Um, we'd like this validation data set to be relatively accurate. Um, so it, it needs to be kind of large, but uh, we don't want it to be too large because we really want as much data for training. So another way to improve the overall quality of our validation uh, data set is to actually construct this split multiple times. So this was one random split. Um, so let's say we were to split it at, at maybe 80%. So this is 80% of our data is for training and another 20% of our data is left out for, for validation. What we could do is we could train our model here and validate here. And then we could repeat the process again, uh, taking the same data set, splitting it at a different location. So we pull out this little middle fragment, this middle 20% of the data, and use the remaining data here to yet train another model and then validate it again against this. And we can do that repeatedly. And in this case, we do that five times for five distinct uh, splits of the data. And this would be called five-fold cross-validation. So in each of these cases, we'd get a, an error measure on these red blocks of data. And then we could average the error measure across all of these blocks to get a pretty good estimate of what our test error might look like without ever having to look at the test error. Uh, and this is relatively robust so that we can run this procedure every time we try a new uh, set of features or a new model design. We can rerun this five stages of training, so five rounds of training, um, five rounds of validation to get an estimate of what the test error would be, again, without peeking at our test data set. So this process simulates multiple train test splits on our training data. Um, you, remember, you may remember from data eight, uh, this is something like the bootstrap. Uh, it's a simpler procedure for evaluating or getting an estimate of what our validation uh, error might be. And in fact, we can even start to get a little distribution, uh, the shape of what that validation error might look like according to this procedure. All right, so that is cross-validation. We don't have to do five-way cross-validation. You can do three, four, seven, uh, but five is a pretty common uh, pattern for, for cross-validation. So five separate splits, you get five repeated uh, observations of the validation error, um, and five rounds of training. If you do more, you're going to pay a lot in extra training. Um, and if you do less, uh, you, you don't get as uh, quite as an accurate of a measure of what your test error might look like. Again, we don't touch the test data. So here we're only operating on this training data set. So I want to give you a recipe for successful generalization. Um, the first and, and most important step is split your training data into a training and test data set. So 90% ideally for training and maybe 10% for test. Then only use the training data when designing training and tuning your model. You do not use it the, you do not look at the test data when making modeling decisions. Um, if you want to look at the test data, you should use cross-validation. So cross-validation gives us a mechanism to estimate what our test or generalization performance will be without ever having to touch the test data. Then you should commit to your final model, train once more using your entire data set, so no five-fold cross-validation, use all the training data, uh, and then you can evaluate your model on the test data set. Now, if you're happy with that, uh, you might train once more with all of the data, including the test data set, and you would then ship your model or deliver it or use it to render predictions on, on uh, new streams. Um, but at this point, you're not making any new design decisions. And once you've trained on the test data set, you can no longer evaluate the generalization performance of that model since you have no new data to test it on. All right, so that is the setup for train test splits uh, and then cross-validation. Um, in the, this notebook, I'm going to now walk through how to use Scikit-Learn, which actually has built-in packages for doing each of these steps. Uh, so I'll talk about how to use Scikit-Learn to uh, construct your, tain, your train and test splits and, and then manage them, and then how to use Scikit-Learn to do uh, cross-validation.